The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss how you can grow watermelons in your backyard, as well as what to do with all that zucchini that you'll soon be harvesting. Our guest is bird expert Laura Erickson, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to another episode of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you've taken time out of your day to allow us to be part of it. Whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023 through our parent website under the Season 7 tab at the top of the page. That website is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com or podcast replay or in studio video replay through our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co host, best friend, and gardening partner. Hi, Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. If you want to partake in the program, in addition to allow it to go into your ears, you can send us an email to garden talk radio at gmail dot com with your questions. Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com, or you can give us a call toll free, coast to coast at 1 800 927 show. That's 1 800 927 7469. Watermelon. Well, we're going to talk about growing watermelon. Yes. Can it, everybody grow watermelon? It, based on the type of watermelon. And it, it, yes, with an asterisk. What about in Antarctica? Can you grow watermelon? Nothing can grow in Antarctica <laughs> except for penguins and ice. Ice, ice grows there. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Seriously, now most people, based on where you're living, you can grow watermelon. Now, the watermelon that you can grow is not going to directly reflect the type in which you're going to purchase at your big grocery store in your town. Because the variety is different and the time and conditions in which is required to grow those big giant watermelons are very dramatically different than where you are in most situations. Right. And so, yeah, you so the biggest thing is, is that you want if you are in a a northern climate, you want something that will grow from seed to harvest within 90 days and there's no hope lost because there are options right yeah yeah the the big giant watermelons that you see they are grown to primarily in a lot of situations in the south yeah a lot of heat and a lot of water and those things love them the the those watermelons love the more heat the more water you can give it the better it off better off it is and that that's great if uh you're living in the south but most of us aren't living in the south no, absolutely not. And one of the one of the things is that that you want to do no matter I guess probably where you live is you want to just direct sow them because their roots are very fragile. Now you can technically start the seeds inside indoors, but when you direct sow them, you take less of a chance of causing damage to the roots. So you can just direct sow them. You want to Make sure your soil temperature is going to be over 65 degrees consistently. You might be excited to put your watermelon seeds in the ground and then you get like a little bit of a cold snap. It's probably not the best for them. You might have to replant them. So definitely make sure you're at the right temperature. Fun fact here about watermelon, Holly. China produces alone more than 60% of the world's watermelons. Wow. And the United States, most watermelons come from Gainesville, Florida. So there you go. How many? 60% 60% China produces worldwide no, watermelon. How many come from Florida? I don't have that statistic. Oh. I just know that that's the majority of where the United States watermelons come from oh. is Gainesville, Florida. I thought they, because I know like I've seen the trucks where they're like um, from Georgia watermelons, Alabama watermelons. Right. Uh, top five producing uh, watermelon states. Here we go. Arizona, California, Delaware, Florida, and Texas. Delaware. Delaware. Uh, yeah, go, right. okay. So back to watermelon planting. So okay. most of us who are listening, I know we have download of all over the world and in the southern portions of the United States. But for you who are listening uh, in areas that are in relatively, you know, challenging times to grow, watermelons 
there is watermelons. We've grown watermelons in Zone 5, where the show originates, and, and, and in our backyard. And we're going to talk about what kind we grew. Right. And we were able successfully to do that because we were able to keep the water to those watermelons. And we did it in the straw bale gardening method. And that is a way of the breaking down the, pro, uh, the, the process of breaking down the internal portions of a straw bale in order to create a soil mixture inside of it for the plants to feed off of. The moisture is retained more relatively uh, than in open, unmulched soil. And that's how we were able to successfully capture a watermelon in our backyard. Yes. So with that being said, you want to keep in mind that you want to direct sow, and then they are going to vine, so you want to give them a lot of space. You need to plant them at least a foot apart and give them room to grow. Now, each watermelon here, you're not going to get like five or six or seven watermelons on a vine. Your best scenario is one to two watermelons per vine because a watermelon takes a lot of energy to produce the melon in which we are harvesting. And the plants know this, and they will kick off or dis, you know, dis detach watermelons that they are trying to grow in order to focus energy on other ones. You can accelerate that by making sure that there's only one or two watermelons on that vine so all the energy is directly uh, into those melons on the vine and not waiting for the, the plant to decide which one they're going to get rid of. Pollination is also a key there, and, and we, have, we all know that as well. Yes, that is the key is pollination. And then they are heavy feeders, so you want to make sure that you have very um, nutrient-rich soil. If you don't, you can always add some sort of... A couple bags of compost. Some compost, yep. You can also, partway through the season, um, go ahead and add an all-purpose fertilizer, you could do a liquid or granular, whatever it may be. Just make sure you're not disturbing the roots or the vine. And if you have a little bit of a sandier soil, that's okay for watermelon. So do not disturb the soil, which means that watermelons take a lot of water. So set up your drip works uh, irrigation system or your tree diaper or your tree hugger sprinkler system at the time of planting. So all you have to do is in some just hit the button or just let it do its natural thing if you're using a tree diaper. So you're not disturbing that root system because these are fragile plants that if you wave at it wrong, it's going to die type of thing. You want to be very careful of how you go about weeding around the plant and feeding the plant as well. Now, key, uh, keeping the days of harvest under 90 days in the cooler climates is a key here. Now, Jung Seeds, J-U-N-G-S-E-E-D.com has watermelon seeds available for uh, larger watermelons. 10 TG23 to save 10% on your order. Now, they do not have the specific watermelon that we're going to talk about. So, disclaimer there. These were seeds we got many years ago. I also want to mention that yes. when, when they do sell these seeds, wherever you find them, they sell it fast. Yes, because so of the availability that you can grow watermelon in a climate where you typically are not able to. So, we grew a... cream. It's called Cream of Saskatchewan. And... It's a it it's kind of a, just a normal looking watermelon, right? Yeah, it's about it's a little bit bigger. Uh, five to ten pounds is what they will get in great scenarios. I think ours was like two pounds, two and a half pounds, and we didn't do the very best gardening parents that we could have been for that watermelon. Um, <laughs> it, it has a rare white flesh, round uh, white flesh internally. Some have more of a, a yellowish tint to it um, at the time of harvest. When to harvest your watermelon? Well, you can get in fistfights about this type of information. We allowed the watermelon to basically detach itself from the vine on its own, and then we knew it was time to harvest. Now, if you're in an area where you can't do that or you have creatures and critters that are going to want to consume that watermelon before you do, which we had one uh, prior to the harvest of the one, we've got it on our our parent uh, are on our YouTube channel, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, uh, watermelon in Wisconsin, something like that, where it shows that we harvested it. Um, but it, you want to, you know, do your research. There's many different techniques and or theories about when the best time and how to harvest a watermelon. And some are true, some are not. Some work sometimes, some don't work other times. But uh, 
cream of Saskatchewan watermelon is what we were able to grow. Uh, five to ten pounds is what they typically will get if all conditions and situations are correct, which that's a decent sized watermelon. Uh, it's not, you know, a watermelon you get at the big box store is like eight to twelve. Maybe you, you squeeze out a ten to fifteen pound, you know, at some point at, at a box I think store. On some level, the smaller ones they call them like personal size yes. watermelons. Yeah, so that's basically what this is. I remember it being sweet. This was several yeah. years ago. That, Did that, it that have we, more of like a cantaloupe flavor? I don't remember, but no, it had a watermelon flavor. It had a watermelon flavor. Yeah. Now you can grow other melons too, but watermelons. Um, I know a lot of people want to grow them and they want to have success. So we definitely recommend checking out the um, other varieties like the Sugar Baby, the Black Tail Mountain, and I think Moon and Stars is another right. one. Uh, is. The, the cream of Saskatchewan will take 80 to 85 days to reach maturity. So you're in that 90-day range. And if you haven't planted watermelon and you're wanting to plant watermelon, uh, do it today. Today... Get it in the ground, get it hydrated, uh, get the best opportunity to get that watermelon to mature uh, before those colder nights come in about 90 days is what we're looking at. So um, anything else we need to add about watermelon? I really don't think so. I think that I think that everybody should try it. You're going to fail. Yeah. That that's just part of the deal. Be aware that, you know, don't expect that your first watermelon if it does great, don't expect it to be, you know, oh, PBS we made it work and everything's great <laughs> type of watermelon. You you probably will fail. So, if you have the space and uh, to do this, I would recommend doing it in the ground. It could be done in a container, but do it in the ground if you have the space. Do 3 or 4 or 5. Increase your odds. And see how that works out for you. If you're in a southern area, you've already got watermelon planted or you have the time now to plant because you're going to have a much longer duration. And you can grow, you know, if you're in Arkansas or Tennessee or Alabama, Georgia, those areas, you're going to have that opportunity to grow that much larger watermelon over a much longer time frame to get what we up here in the north go, oh, that's a good watermelon, clink, clink, clink at the store and we pay like six dollars for it. And we think it's great. And sometimes you can find better deals, but just like anything else that you grow yourself, it's going to have better flavor, taste fresher, and it's a reward. Walton's has great deals as well for us, Holly. Yeah, we are brought to you today by our sponsors, Walton's Inc. We know you care about where your food comes from, canning, preserving, growing, your fruits, vegetables, etc. But what about the meat? At Walton's, you can get everything you need, equipment, seasoning, supplies to make sausage, jerkies, meat sticks, your way to your high standards you want to make some delicious meat sticks meat just com has an informational site to help you make the best finished product they have a full line of their meat grinders mixers sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible at walton's everything but the meat we got a code for you here use code grow 50 grow 50 to save 10 percent off your orders of 50 dollars or more that's waltonsinc.com code grow 50 when we come back we're going to talk about all the things you can do with the zucchinis that you'll be harvesting you're tuned in to the garden with join holly radio show got a question for joey and holly send it via email anytime to garden talk radio at gmail.com Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products to last a lifetime. They are built beyond tough. The wallets are low-profile, made out of high-quality aluminum, and options to upgrade. Access your cards and cash without bulk. Guaranteed to last a lifetime, it's the last wallet you'll ever need. Your traditional wallet is big and bulky and not easy to access the cards you need conveniently. Grip6 has a quick array access for your cards. You can also add money bands for cash, more cards, business cards, and more. Variable capacity for minimalist or maximalist. Lightweight, sleek, and no wallet bulk in your pocket while gardening, working outside, or enjoying the great outdoors. Designed and manufactured in-house for best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at Grip6.com. Use code RADIO15 to save 15% off at Grip6.com. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, 
Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control, watering, and seeding. You can find Chapin products at your local hardware store, big box retailer. You may visit them also online at ChapinMFG.com to learn more and buy online. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy Plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloomingeasyplants.com. Mantis Tillers, the premium long-lasting gas-powered tillers, are the perfect solution for any garden. This Mantis machine is available with two or four cycle engines with a 19-inch or 16-inch tilling width. Your DIY companion in your garden and your lawn converts easily for edging, aerating, and more with optional attachments. Find details at mantis.com. A non-selective herbicide that is USDA certified? Yup, no more weeds by Naturally Green Products. The same great company that brings you no more bugs. No more weeds kills weeds with no harsh chemicals and no glyphosate. No more weeds is a commercial grade vinegar base with a proprietary sticking agent. Great around pools, decks, patios, and more. Visit natgreenproducts.com. Free shipping on orders over $50 using code free ship for me make watering easy dripworks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the u.s and canada purchase online at dripworks.com jung seed company is a family owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online use coupon code 10 tg 23 to receive 10 percent off your order at jungseeds.com again that coupon code is 10 tg Two, three. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your day. Moments away, how you can deal with all that zucchini, some unique ways to utilize that vegetable. But first, a word from our friends at Farm Defense. Farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Their sleeves are often they're co- offer cooling, comfort, and protection against the elements outdoors. You want to say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of wicky material with UBF protection factor 50 plus to protect you from the allergens and scratches. To find all their products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. So, zucchini. People plant three plants thinking, hey, we're going to have enough, and they have dozens and dozens of pounds of zucchini coming out of their garden and they are at uh, the mercy of what they can do with it outside of throwing it in the compost bin there is a national put your what is it put zucchini on your neighbor's porch day which i think what is in august or something like that uh it's august 8th august stole my fun fact. Oh, okay well <laughs> I knew you were looking that up because we you didn't. Uh, we, I forgot what day it yeah. was. I knew it, and then I for, I forgot. So you you it's, it's August eighth. It's National Leave Zucchini on Your Neighbor's Porch Day. It's kind of like the uh, National or World Naked Gardening Day. It's not really a law or anything, and you really got to be careful where you know in this time of age walking on people's porches and leaving you stuff. You also probably got to be careful naked gardening too. Well, but, you, but yeah, and and, the, and you leave the you always lock your car doors because people come out and there'll be <laughs> you know five zucchinis in the front seat type of thing. Yeah. No, I you should probably lock your car doors for many reasons, but definitely yeah. because of zucchini. Yeah, that um, that would be the least of my concerns, you know. The engine's gone, the wheel's gone. Oh, I got zucchini. Well, that that's good. So, there, obviously we can we can do the, I grew up y- utilizing zucchini of the meal being Cut it thin, roll it in egg, cornmeal, fried in a pan with oil. And then that was how we utilized zucchini. You can make zucchini relish. We made that as well uh, growing up. 
And then you made zucchini relish when you were growing up. I, I, we made zu- everything. I didn't know that. Yeah, we made grape juice, grape jelly, grape jam. We, anything that could go in a can, that was what was made. We made um, zucchini bread growing up. Okay, we, which which you can trick people because they think it's banana bread. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And I remember. Uh, Don't uh, do that if somebody's allergic to zucchini. By the way, are people allergic to zucchini? I am assuming that oh. people are allergic to everything now. That's true. Between yeah. to, to trees, to air, to ice. You know, everybody's allergic to something. Ice. Why not? Um, actually, some people do have like where they get too cold. Uh-huh. So if they're around ice, I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what you do with the zucchini, you can you can freeze it. And so some people will blanch it and then freeze it. Some people uh, will. And in what capacity? Like in a shredded capacity or they're not you know, taking the whole thing and just throw it in the freezer? No, no, no. Yeah. So you would shred it. A lot of people will shred it. And then in that case, you would shred it. And just as is, you wouldn't try to blanch it you would just put it in some freezer bags and then you can add it to like soup stocks you can add it to, then then you can bake with it too right to so that you have it fresh well the problem is that if it gets too big it becomes very difficult to consume because the seeds are so large so then you would take and turn it into like zucchini relish or, or, or zucchini bread, utilize it in that manner, the frying it up because you got, you know, basically the same seeds that you planted are inside because it's, you know, it's seven pounds and, and uh, the size of, uh, you know, four, four inches in diameter gets quite woody. So I guess it's good to mention then when you are harvesting your zucchini, if you see one that's perfect for harvesting. Get it. Get it. Yeah. Don't wait until the next day because I feel like they grow twice in size uh-huh. overnight. Yeah. So yeah, you can freeze you can freeze the zucchini. You can add it to desserts. And Joey has a story about the zucchini apple pie. Yeah. Um, many many years ago, not so many years, but anyway, ten years ago probably. Holly and I were at a farmers market retail. You know, it's a barn where you go and buy the local farm stuff. And the woman said that um, you can take zucchini and do every put the zucchini to the side, make your apple pie. Do everything with the apple pie, prepare it, do everything except for adding apples. Instead of adding adding apples, add zucchini, and nobody will know the difference because the zucchini, I think, is the mushroom of the vegetable world. Zucchini will absorb flavor very, very well. So when you're adding the cinnamon and the sugar and all those things in which you add into an apple pie, instead of adding the apples, you're adding chunks, you're, you're, you're processing and putting the zucchini in. That becomes now the flavor of, you know, you think, oh, cinnamon, sugar, tastes like apples. Well, it's really zucchini. So you can make apple pie but use zucchini. You can also do mock pineapple with yeah. zucchini. Yeah, that's This is a canning procedure. Kind of a dessert but not. Um, so, yeah, you make mock, mock pineapple and you basically take the zucchini, you peel it, get the seeds out, cut it into little pineapple chunk mm-hmm. sizes. And then you cook it in some sugar, pineapple juice, water, and then it becomes uh, it, it kind of absorbs that pineapple flavor. And then again with the mushroom, you know, mushrooms absorb flavor, and same yeah. zucchini, same thing. Yeah. So then it becomes the the pineapple kind of. It just doesn't have that same the same exact texture as pineapple, but it's Te- yeah, still good. Pineapple has you know that stringy type. You would I I, I I incorporate pineapple with kind of a stringy when you chew into it. It kind of tears. Zucchini doesn't have that. But for people who like pineapple but are not really familiar with the texture, the dead bringer every time you uh, you know they, they do not know it's zucchini. That's how realistic it is uh, in in mimicking. Pineapple. Now you water bath this, and there's a procedure, and there's a um, a YouTube video that we have on our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. In the search bar, just put in mock zucchini or mock pineapple, something like that, and it'll come up. And Holly walks you through how to do that with the zucchinis coming out of your your garden. But it's a very unique way of doing such. Now, obviously, you're not you got you got to purchase pineapple juice in order to make this happen but um so one thing i want to mention is you can make zucchini pickles but if you make them you want to make them fresh you don't want to can them because they can get very mushy uh so you make like refrigerator pickles with them right now zucchini is whenever you make cucumber pickles heat is the enemy of the pickle and the more heat you do 
the longer in the water bath, the spongier or the softer the cucumbers can get. That's why people recommend doing them in pint jars instead of quart jars. Now, our grandparents did them in half-gallon jars, but that's a whole other story. Um, now, zucchini, I don't think, has the same texture as a cucumber, which meaning, meaning that it wouldn't get as spongy. But with any canning procedure, you want to use the freshest of fresh you can. You just don't want to go, okay, we'll collect for X amount of days, then we'll process because that first stuff is going to have aged and started to, in scientific terms, started to decay or break down and become soft and not firm like the fresh zucchini or tomato or uh, whatever you're harvesting out of the garden. Um, so one thing I also wanted to mention is that you can, you can give it away and there's people that, that, that do that there, there, I know there's people that are listening. They have massive gardens, yeah. beautiful gardens. They don't grow zucchini because they know that they are going to get inundated by people who have too many zucchini plants that are begging to get rid of it. Right. I only planted two zucchini plants this year because I know that we will have zucchini from other places coming in. Uh, so, but people don't understand the uh, productive rate in which zucchini plants can produce. Now, we're talking zucchini black beauty. We're talking crookneck. We're talking talking yellow uh, zucchini, and a zucchini plant can produce very quickly and rapidly in the proper conditions. Yes, and I, I guess I want to heed caution that there are ways that you might have problems growing yeah. zucchini there are um different bugs the what's it called um, um uh vine, squ squash vine borer yeah, squash vine borer and then also just sometimes people just don't have the best luck growing zucchini so if you're like i've attempted to grow zucchini 1700 times why what's wrong with me it's nothing there's a lot of things that all of us can't grow and that's okay. Don't feel like a failure. Maybe somebody will leave some on your porch on August 8th. Zucchini, uh, one zucchini plant on average will produce between 3 and 10 pounds of zucchini. Now, that is a skewed average because if you allow one zucchini, hey, I'll get it tomorrow. Oh, I forgot it. That zucchini can very quickly multiply to 8 or 9 pounds just on one zucchini. People ch can choose to harvest that zucchini at whatever stage they want. But the larger it is, the woodier it gets, the larger the seeds are. You see the little petite uh, six or seven inch long zucchini that's about an inch or two inches in diameter that you see on the cooking shows. That's what uh, a lot of people chew would do not want to harvest. It. Well, I wouldn't want – growing up, I didn't harvest that because if I let it get bigger, there will be more zucchini. The, the, the actual harvesting item will be larger. But if you harvest them small, the plant will produce more and they'll be more manageable and much more tender because the seeds have not matured inside of that zucchini um, fruit or harvesting item. Yeah, tastier, um, easier to enjoy, and then not overkill of zucchini. Yeah, and once you plant zucchini, you can start expecting them about 35 to 55 days in that range. And if you continue to harvest at a reasonable size, the plants will produce until cold weather hits or, in most instances, you get powdery mildew that starts to develop on the plants, and then that is the demise of the plant. But at that point, many people are so tired of zucchini that they welcome that disease to come in and kill off the zucchini plant, uh, which is a horrible thing. But you want the zucchini plant to die, but you want the pumpkin to kill, still live. But typically, once it hits part of your garden, it's going to hit all of the garden because of the cool nights and the dampness on the leaves not being able to dry up before the cool nights come and that's when mildew develops absolutely if you want to control beetle and grub invaders without affecting the rest of the ecosystem in your yard then grub gone and beetle gone are the solution phylums grub gone and beetle gone target a wide range of invasive and destructive beetles weevils and borers without harming non-targets such as bees ladybugs butterflies earthworms and other beneficial insects. You can purchase these products locally in Massachusetts at Ward's Nursery, UQ Garden Center in Hyannis County Garden, in Connecticut at Van Wilgren's Garden Center, in Maine at Salisbury Organics, in New York at Fadigan's Nursery, in Ohio at Berlin Seeds. Phylum Bioproducts, that's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Target the pest, not the rest. When we come back, hang out with us, Laura 
Erickson will be with us, bird expert and author. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Going on vacation and can't find a plant sitter? Check out Tree Diaper. It can provide perfect soil moisture for plants for weeks, even months. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at TreeDiaper.com. Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy-to-install pond and water filled kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit Aqua-Mart.com to shop for all your needs. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. Money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. Ah, spring, the season of renewal, an unexpected house guest, none the worse perhaps than ants. And I'm not talking about great Aunt Mabel. When you need to get rid of ants fast, you need rescue ant baits. Rescue Ant Baits are pre-baited, child-resistant, and ready to use right out of the box. No sticky liquid, no mess. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular Rescue Fly and Yellow Jacket Traps. Learn more at Rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot C-O-M. Hi, I'm Russell Taylor with Live Earth Products. I'm a soil health expert here to help you. Live Earth Products specializes in soil conditioners and fertilizers that will help you build healthy and vibrant flower and vegetable gardens. As our name describes, Live Earth means healthy soils. Live Earth products are humic and fulvic soil amendments and are all natural, organic, and directly from our family mine in Utah. Live Earth products are easy to apply and the results will blossom right before your eyes. Live Earth products can be applied throughout the growing season. So pick up Live Earth Humate Soil Conditioner, our liquid six humic acid, at your local garden center or on Amazon. Also available through our website, liveearth.com, that's L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. Live Earth, here to bring vitality to life in your garden. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. The Garden with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Laura Erickson, moments away, but first, Rise Gardens, Holly. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles. Before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app. Step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest. A complete garden on a shelf. And it comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information to get your Rise Garden, visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Laura Erickson has been a scientist, teacher, writer, licensed wildlife rehabilitator, blogger, public speaker, photographer, American robin and whooping crane expert. She's written 13 books on birds and is the recipient of the American Horticultural Society's Book Award for 2023 for her book on 100 plants to feed the birds. Welcome to the program, Laura. Hi, thank you so much. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to educate not only Holly and myself and all of our listeners. And I'll start with this. Many people discover birding as a hobby later on in life. How did you get into the uh, fascinating world of birds and bird watching? I loved birds since I was a very small child. Many of my earliest memories are of looking at pigeons. 
I became a birder as an adult. When I was 23, my husband told his mom to buy me binoculars and a field guide for Christmas, and I instantly became addicted. Uh, I mean, we we enjoy birds and looking at birds. I find, you know, you, know, you got the robins and the orioles and the the all these other ones. I think the owls are very fascinating to me. They are. I lived with an owl named Archimedes, a tiny little eastern screech owl, for seventeen years, and um, I can affirm that they are indeed fascinating. He was an education bird that I was licensed to keep to take to school programs and other venues. And he reminded me in many ways of a cat. He (laughs) could be active in the daytime or the nighttime. He had very cat-like eyes, and he was just a delight. That's so neat. So many gardeners are often, you know, they don't want birds in the garden. They think that they're going to pick up their tomatoes or eat their berries or whatever. How are birds helpful to the garden? Well, when we grew tomatoes here in Duluth, Minnesota, um, many times slugs go after them too. And common grackles love eating slugs. There are a lot of interactions between birds and our fruits that we would just as soon not have to deal with, but they eat a host of insect pests that cause even more damage to plants, and they bring so much music and color, and uh, they're such an integral part of nature that, you know, recent studies have shown that people benefit both in uh, their physical health and their mental health from hearing bird song. So there's just all kinds of good reasons to want birds around, even if you do have to provide some protection to your plants to keep the birds from eating the things you want, like your tomatoes. And I'm going to assume, with an, as an expert in, in your field, you doing this so long, your eyes closed, you can identify what bird it is based on the tone of their song or their noise. Uh, yes, but nowadays, just about anybody can do this. If you have uh, um, an app called Merlin, when you turn that app on, it's free from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. If you just do a Google search on Merlin app and bird song, it, you'll find it, and it's free. And if you just turn it on when you're hearing a bird, it will list every bird singing. And if a robin is singing, and then it hears a red-winged blackbird, and then it hears an oriole, and the Robin starts up again, but that robin will be highlighted again. So as each bird enters, even if it's already listed, it, it'll highlight it again. So you can learn which is which and the sounds you're hearing. A very unique way technology can benefit us in a positive way. Right. It's kind of fascinating when you live in a, a with all the the things you're paying attention to being the lowest tech things of all, birds, and uh, you get so much benefit from high tech for learning about them. Definitely. Um, so your book, 100 Plants to Feed Birds, just won the American Horticultural Society's Book Award. Please tell us. You can tell us about maybe why it won the award or something that would pique the interest of our listeners um, to go pick up a copy. And also, what book of yours would you recommend to a newer bird watcher? Uh, Well, like I said, when we're thinking about our yards, both our gardens per se, not so much those, because things like tomatoes, our cherry trees, 
um, some of the flowers we like to grow aren't native. They're not part of the local natural environment, even though they're so beautiful or tasty and essential to us. But many of the just background plants in our yards, the trees and shrubs that we have, can play a really important role in our neighborhood becoming more of what it needs to be to have the birds from our part of wherever we live um, make comebacks. We've lost so many natural insects and uh, natural birds to uh, so much development. And when we're making, you know, like I in my yard, I have box elder trees. And those are like waving a red flag up in the sky. Eat it, Laura's, because they ha- uh, when they have box elder seeds, if evening growth speaks are flying over, they zip down to eat my box elder seeds. Uh, different plants that we have, um, my service berry or June berry shrubs bring in cedar wax wings, bring in robins. Uh, many kinds of fruit eaters come to them. Cedar wax wings come for in spring, the day the cherry blossoms and apple blossoms open up because they eat some of the petals. They don't pig out and wipe out all the petals on your tree, but they just add so much beauty. Now, hey, and go ahead. Uh, But all the natural plants we have and the plants that support birds bring in so much magic to our yards beyond when we're digging in the dirt. It's kind of nice to look up and see something vivid like an oriole. Um, Bird, and I think you touched on this, most gardeners understand how to bring pollinators into their garden. Uh, I'm assuming by incorporating native plants, you can attract the birds just like you described, in addition to bird feeders and bird baths. Exactly. And certain plants are really important. There's like tight relationships between certain birds and very specific plants. Hummingbirds will just show up like magic during their migration. If you have bee balm, cardinal flower, or jewelweed, as the babies are, as the males are no longer necessary for their family life because they don't, um, they don't pay attention to their babies. Uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds, when they start migrating first in July. That's right when some of these flowers are opening up and you can just see the most beautiful flowers, uh, flower hummingbird interactions. If you have bee balm or jewelweed, some plants are just very specific to birds. Many of the composite plants draw goldfinches, indigo buntings, and other very colorful or pretty little seed-eating birds. There's oak trees provide acorns. We all know about that, which are essential for blue jays. Florida scrub jays are very dependent on uh, scrub oak down in Florida. Each kind of plant can have some very tight relationships with birds, but also oak trees long before they're producing any acorns at all. Every spring as their buds open up, tiny native caterpillars emerge, which are one of the essential foods for colorful warblers and scarlet tanagers as they're migrating through. So it's um, really nice to provide plants thinking about what birds could come to them so you're aware of the interplays. Now, for people who are bringing, uh, creating a native environment, bird feeds, bird bath, what is your recommendation about bird houses? Do you advise them? Advise not to do that in their backyard. What is, what is your what is your advice on that? Bird houses are very tricky if they have a perch on them sticking out like little front porch for birds. That actually makes them. Um, 
very likely to attract house sparrows. And those all are not a native bird. They cause a lot of problems for native birds. And they don't need subsidized housing. If you live in a place with bluebirds or tree swallows and can monitor it, those make wonderful uh, additions on a fence line, say. Uh, chickadee houses can be a little tricky because you have to know enough about what house wrens like to put the chickadee house where the house wrens are not likely to want it. Otherwise, the house wren male will take over every little crevice on his territory that might seem pretty to a female, and he will actually puncture all the chickadee nests uh, eggs to take over that nest box. So providing nest boxes is trickier than a lot of things. That's where they're going to be raising their babies, and the, the birds using it are very vulnerable, and we need to make sure we're doing it right. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a really good website um, that helps uh, with monitoring birdhouses. If you just go to Cor um, Cornell's All About Birds, you can look up different birds that you might want to attract, and you'll get all kinds of helpful information about the safest ways to do it. Fantastic. So we've really enjoyed having you on the program, Laura, um, and your great information. How can people find out more about you? I know you mentioned the, the Cornell Ornithology Department, but how can people find more about you and your books and your great information? My website is simply lauraerickson.com, and it's got a host of stuff about birds, how to help them, and lots and lots of pictures and recordings. Well, Laura, we greatly appreciate the very important and wonderful knowledge you've shared with all of us about birds and what to do and what not to do that we thought we were helping birds by like putting birdhouses and nesting boxes in our yard. Now we know that uh, we need to be more cautious about that, and we appreciate that information. Thank you for it. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Dripping Springs Oreos clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oreos, O-L-L-A-S, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again over apply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit Rootmaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at Rootmaker.com. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection of customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Tree Hugger Sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent 
independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers, and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com. Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com. Fleet Farms Garden Center is now open. Stop in to check out their selection of nursery quality plants available at low prices. All of their plants are grown in the Midwest and their vegetables are incesticide free. Choose from annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and more. Plus take care of your lawn with grass seed fertilizers, lawnmowers, and string trimmers. Get everything you need to keep your yard looking great at Fleet Farm, your lawn and garden headquarters. The Gardening with Join Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joe and Allie radio show. Again, thank you for allowing us to be part of your day, whether you choose to listen to us on the radio or download the program on your favorite podcast platform or watching us or in the in-studio video replay on um, YouTube or our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Time for question and answers. If you've got a question, we've got an answer. Send it on over to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com or give us a call anytime, coast to coast, toll free, 1 800 927 show, 1 800 927 7469. If we can't get to you, leave a message and we will call you back. This question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. We have planted potatoes in buckets. Now there is something eating, eating the leaves. My husband has sprayed neem oil on the plants themselves, but it doesn't seem like it's working. Where are these pests? Where are they coming from? What can I do? I'm just running out of options, it seems. All right. It sounds like you have Colorado potato beetle eating your plants. If beetle numbers are large, treat them with an approved insecticide that won't harm the plant. There are natural products like BT for beetles, and which is a natural occurring bacteria treatment that will kill the young potato beetle larva. It is less effective on older larvae and adults. If you use neem oil, that will work for the larvae, but it does not work very effective on the adults. Removal by manual means is a best uh, scenario for the adults. Some people will take a vacuum out and suck them in the vacuum. Um, you can crush the eggs by wearing gloves underneath. You raise your, the leaves up and they're going to be underneath. Any application you apply, try to make it organic and make sure you douse the leaves top, bottom, the whole plant because that's where a lot of people have the uh, misconception of, oh, I sprayed the plant, meaning the top of the plant, and it must be good, but they did not capsulate or spray under the leaves and the stem and around the base in order to kill everything they're trying to for this instance the colorado potato beetle larvae but uh, the the removal of the adults is probably going to be the most effective and then do the treatment with the bt or the neem oil to uh, get the larvae under control all right holly is trellising necessary for better production in the garden I believe so. I think overall, yes, especially if it makes sense to trellis. If you have, um, if you if you are maybe limited on space, that's one thing. You can increase your space, your ground space, and for things like tomatoes, it keeps them off the ground where they can rot, and that will definitely improve your production. I think by like fifty percent. Correct. Um, and then it's just easier. So if you trellis all your things like cucumbers, beans, etc you can find them to pick them easier instead of having to dig through a bunch of vines that and, are on the ground. Well, and, and growing pole beans on the ground, just they don't do good at all. Cucumbers, There's a reason why they're called pole beans. Right. Cucumbers, yeah. they will sprawl across the ground. However, the leaves are covering the fruit, and you're going to miss one or two, and you're going to get the size of a football 
uh, cucumber, and then you that don't want to eat that. And you don't want to eat no. that, mm-hmm. and it will also have some tendencies in order. The plant could shut down because it has matured the seeds in that. If you leave it and forget it and not see it long enough, and that plant has matured the seeds in that fruit, and it's done. Doesn't care. Not producing it for you. It's producing naturally for reproductive of next year's seeds. I guess my question would be is like, why wouldn't you want a trellis more or less? Um, I think that there are just many benefits to it. Maybe you don't like how it looks or something. You could get creative with trellises or find some really nice, pretty ones. But in most a- in most aspects, you're going to get a better production. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I totally Pollinators agree. are going to be able to access the flowers better for cucumbers, example, and uh, just going to be all around better and uh, easier to to harvest. So, next question yes. is, last year, the Japanese beetles took over my apple trees. I had some of the bag traps, but I've heard conflicting things about them. The bags filled up, but there was still a bunch of these Japanese beetles on my trees. Do you have any suggestions? I heard you mentioned something about some, putting something into the grass to kill the larva. Is it too late? What should I do? Okay, the bags from rescue at rescue.com, R-E-S-C-U-E, uh, the Japanese beetle traps, very work very, very well. It is best to put the bags as far away from the potential issue as possible or past year's problems. Don't put it 10 feet from the tree or under the tree. Put it, if you can get 90 feet away, if you can get it to the edge of the property. So as the insects fly, they will be attracted by that lure that's in the rescue trap, and they will go in the bag and not go towards the trees. So keep that, that, that is the way, the best recommendation, if you can get it 90, 120 feet, not near the problem. Um, you can also use phylum bio products. It can irrigate in the ground to um, kill the larvae, but that is in the spring. We're past that at this point. The uh, beetles lay, the, the mature beetles lay small uh, white eggs in the soil. If moisture is signi- uh, sufficient, the eggs will absorb it and enlarge and become around, and then they will hatch. So at this point, beetle gone is the best solution um, um, to do that. That's grub gone if you want to use that in spring. Beetle gone, it is a BT product that is natural that you spray on the plant. You can use it on trees, your vegetables, and it will kill the Japanese beetles, and it's a the only natural way in order to do such. And you can buy uh, the the bag and do it. it's a water soluble, uh, dissolvable uh, product that you spray on your trees, and it will kill the beetles and do a phenomenal job. And you can have apple tree apples and pears and peaches and whatever else you know. And 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 Japanese beetles are predominant. Uh, in my experience with pole beans and bush beans um, and cherry trees growing up. So you can spray it directly on the plants, no problem whatsoever, uh, apply, and uh, you can go that route. Naturally occurring bacteria, grub gone, uh, non-chemical BT product that specifically targets those uh, pests, and they do not hurt the beneficial insects like bees, butterflies, and insects. All right. Um, all right, so the next yes. question is, um, I was wondering if there's something... Let's, let's go number five real quick. Okay. Yeah. I have I have what I think is an issue on my zucchini plants. It looks like powdery mildew, but I, when I touch it, nothing comes off. It looks silver. Um, so that would not be powdery mildew. Which on, is a good pro, which is a good thing. That's yeah. a good thing. Um, and... That's silver molding. Yes. Yeah, modeling. Molding, modeling. M- mod- modeling. Modeling, yeah. Yeah. This is just a natural... Uh, way some zucchini plants grow. Uh, often people misdiagnose this as being powdery mildew, but the powdery mildew is uh, most occurrence is in the later portions of the growing season when the night temperatures are, uh, the plant gets wet and the nighttime temperatures are not warm enough in order to dry the moisture off of the, uh, the leaf and mildew begins to develop. And then without proper procedural applications of home remedies or commercial available products, your plant will suffocate because that mildew is preventing photosynthesis and it's choking the plant out. Uh, we talked about in first seg- or second segment, most times your zucchini, you're already tired of it anyway, so you just kind of let it go. But this is effective on cucumbers, pumpkins, and other vine crops, uh, grapes, 
uh, I think uh, watermelons as well. So this is a problem that um, on the powdery mildew. So this is a good problem that it's not. It's nothing you need to do about it. It's just the way the plant grows. So congratulations, you don't have powdery mildew. Thank you for writing in and asking the question. Well, with that being said, Holly, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it, you can certainly do that by going to our parent website and, or, and searching the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show under the Season 7 tab or sending us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail. Dot com. Tune in next week to the program where we'll be discussing hardscaping on your property, as well as the pros and cons of rain barrels. Our guest is author Tony Gattatoni, and we'll answer more of your garden questions. So until next week for... Hi, Baird. I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. Hi.